The reading is from Matthew chapter 28, verses 16 through 20, and is on page 812 of your Pew Bible. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. And a reading from Genesis 1. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that were under the dome from the waters that were above the dome, and it was so. God called the dome sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the waters that were gathered together they called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with a seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding a seed of every kind, and trees of every kind bearing fruit with the seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good, and there was evening, and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind, with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the waters in the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the cattle and over all the wild animals of the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in their image. 
In the image of God, they created them. Male and female, they created them. And God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that they had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all their multitude. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that they had done, and they rested on the seventh day from all the work that they had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that they had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, who loves us with a transforming love, from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, and from the Spirit who unites us all. Amen. In July of 2011, three friends and I piled into my car and drove west toward California. And we saw and did many things, but the thing that stands out the most for me is our trip to the Grand Canyon. I had never been, even though I had lived on the west coast, not so far from the Grand Canyon, for over 30 years. Driving in, I was surprised to be driving through a forest. It never occurred to me that there would be forested land around this amazing wonder. So there we were, driving, marveling at the forest, and the next thing I know, there's a big, beautiful, awe-inspiring hole in the ground, right there. It shocked me. And our first evening there, we hiked down into the canyon a little ways and sat on the very edge of the cliff, watching the sunset. The vastness was overwhelmingly beautiful as the light played across the depths and the heights of the canyon. And then after dinner, in the utter darkness of night, we went to the south rim, that first place that you can stop to look out upon the canyon, and we laid down on the smooth rocks that were still warm from the heat of the day, so they warmed my back as the desert air chilled around me, and we looked at the stars. It was in this still, quiet moment that I saw the Milky Way for the very first time. I was 40 years old, but I had grown up in the city, and so there was always ambient light that prevented me from seeing any stars, really. So when I gazed up at the sky and saw this brush stroke of glittering diamonds, I didn't know what I was looking at. I just knew that what I was seeing was one of the most beautiful and mysterious things that I had ever seen. I didn't need all the details. I didn't need to understand fully how it was formed. I didn't need equations and history and facts to tell me that what I beheld was a marvel of our universe that made me feel both small and alone, and big and fully connected to everything around me. That's what our natural world often does to me. It keeps me so enthralled. The way the colors play against each other, the formations of the clouds and mountains and trees along a river, the bright green of spring against the blueness of the sky and the darkness of the bark, the sounds that come alive as the sun rises, encouraging all creation to get up and behold the beauty that unfolds before them, the stillness at twilight that bids me to slow down and breathe in the air as the sky slowly darkens and night falls. It is all a wonder to me, this world of ours, this creation of God's. And while I'm fascinated by the facts and the science of all because they hold a wonder of their own, I don't need it to understand my place in this universe the gift that God has given me. The writers of Genesis, 
they weren't interested in the facts either. They were interested in making this beautiful poetic story alive for people as they heard it. They were telling the story of how God ordered the chaos and began a relationship with human beings and all of creation, which we miss if we get ourselves hung up on trying to explain it exactly, like how many hours were in those days? Where did the dinosaurs fit in? It's a way to capture the listener's attention as they were told the story of the God that they were worshiping to explain the beauty all around them and the beauty of the relationship that they had to the one who created it all and then invited the creation to join them in that creating. I don't know if you noticed as I read the first creation story, I had never noticed this before, but in the middle of the story, God invites creation to join them in the creating where we hear, let the waters bring forth, let the earth bring forth. In this act of creating, God gives the earth and the animals to the ability to create more life. And it continues on as God creates humankind and then invites them into the role of co-creators. There they were, creator, word, and spirit, delighting in everything around them and not keeping that delight to themselves, but inviting all that they had made to join them in that creative work imbuing the very humanity they created with the spirit of creation, imbuing every living thing with that spirit, giving humanity the ability to care and to tend to everything that they see. What a gift we have been given. But it doesn't stop there with the creation story. Humans will figure out how to till the earth, partnering with the earth to create ways to sustain humanity. Moses is given control over nature at various times in his ministry as a way to lead and to care for the wandering people. Joseph is given the ability to understand dreams and with the knowledge creates a way to feed people when no food is growing. Over and over again, women give birth to new life and nurture it, and these lives that they nurture will change the course of Israel time and again until Mary agrees to join God in creating the Savior, who is none other than the Creator themselves, and that Savior will change the whole of the world. And the disciples are witness to the ways that Jesus creates peace and healing and wholeness throughout his ministry. And now at the end of Matthew's Gospel, they are invited in one more time. The disciples of Jesus are invited into a renewal, a new creation, a creative task that once again brings us back to the renewing relationship with our Creator. What I love about Matthew's Gospel is that he tells us these amazing things, but he's also very upfront about what it's like to follow Jesus, that you will worship him, you will worship God, and you will still carry doubts. That you can be both worshiping and doubting at the same time, and that Jesus will still send you out. That Jesus will still show up. Because what are questions and doubts if not the beginning of the creative process? There's room for all of it in God's creation. It's what we were created to do. And with these final words, Matthew sends us back to the examples of discipleship that we've been given by Jesus throughout his story. We're set back to the very, very beginning, to Emmanuel, remembering that God is with us and has been with us. We remember the baptism of Jesus where God is fully present, parent, child, and spirit. We remember Peter and Andrew being called to fish for people, We remember the ways that Jesus reinterprets the Ten Commandments in the Sermon on the Mount so that we can live as deeper disciples of God. We remember Jesus teaching his disciples how to make disciples when he sends them out. How Jesus models compassion and leadership for us. How Jesus tells us stories that remind us to be humble like children, to welcome others, 
to not harm, and to forgive one another. Those listening to Matthew's story of Jesus are reminded of all of this, reminded that making a disciple first requires us to be disciples, as one commentator put it. We are not meant to bash people over the head with our carefully chosen Bible verses. We're not meant to shame and guilt people into behavior that we have somehow deemed acceptable. We are not called to be judge and jury. Instead, we are called to love with all humility all people of this earth. And Matthew then does what Jesus has done his whole ministry. Matthew expands the boundaries of God's love from this little piece of beautiful land in the Middle East to all the nations of the world. These same nations that Revelation tells us will be gathered around the throne of God one day. The same nations that the Gospel of John says that Jesus draws to himself. The same nations that is all the nations that are a beautiful representation of God's diverse creation. The disciples here at the end of Matthew become co-creators once again, this time in the kingdom of heaven, right here with us, doubts and all, called to proclaim the life-giving revelation found in Jesus the Christ, who is God the creator, who will always be with the disciples in the form of the Holy Spirit, which we will never quite understand, this three-in-one God of ours. Every commentary I read this week said, this is a great chance to figure out the Holy Trinity or something very similar. Like, And I said, I don't want to. Because I don't think we are meant to fully understand. Instead, we spend our time here on earth deepening our faith, our understanding, and our knowledge of this amazing creator whose love is deeper than we can imagine and whose mercy is wider than our comprehension allows for. And we live in the beautiful mystery of it all. We will never fully understand the Holy Trinity, much like I will never understand all the science behind the beauty of our universe. And that's okay. Living in the mystery is part of the beauty. We may not have all the facts about what makes our God our God, or exactly how the universe was made, but we know enough We know enough to trust that this God, creator, word, spirit, is our strength and refuge and hope as we live this life. We know enough. And so we live lives that reflect the call of co-creators, a life of love and peace and justice, working to reveal the kingdom of God among us, to live in awe of God's love, to be open to the possibilities presented to us, and to trust even though we don't know everything. And in that trust, and in this beautiful, maddening life, we find rest for our restless hearts and minds. We rest in the knowledge of our worth and the love that is ours that warms our back as we gaze in awe and wonder at the world we behold, the cool air swirling gently around us. So friends, come. Join God in creating a world of beauty. Come join Jesus in creating a world of love. Come join the Spirit in creating a world of peace and justice. Come with all you are, doubts, sureties, everything, and worship our God. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing.